You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Vuelta España in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I am with Lionel Burney. Good evening, Richard. Well, we're not actually together, are we, Lionel? We're remote. We are, yeah. Yeah, sadly. Yeah, where are, where are you? I'm on the South Bank uh, in sweltering London, so forgive any background noises, uh, various musicians and other people around. It's a beautiful summer's evening. Um, tomorrow, I head to Spain and the Vuelta. Uh, to catch up with Daniel Freib and other people there. Francois Thomas, our friend from the Tour de France, is there as well, and Andy Hood. So we will rope in various guests over the next couple of weeks as the race as the race hots up. Um, but today was another another exciting stage, it, perhaps not for, for a lot of it, but certainly in the end there was much incident, much drama, many talking points. T- give us a tale of the etapa, please, Lionel. I will do. Yes, stage five from Viviero to Lugo, 171 kilometres. It was a bit of a Spanish-style siesta of a day to start with. Um, They had a bit of rain early on in the stage and sweltering here in uh, the south of England, I was quite envious of a little bit of rain there. But um, the rain cleared up and it dried up towards the end of the day. The breakaway was a two-man breakaway today. Tiago Machado of Katusha and Julian Maurice of Direct Energy, presumably inspired by his teammate who won the stage yesterday. They got away and their lead was six and a half minutes at its biggest advantage. Um, the peloton reeled them in a bit and with 75 kilometres to go, they had three and a bit minutes lead and that was when Maurice was rather surprisingly dropped. Um, Machado pushed on alone. And as they hit the small climbs, his advantage slowly rose again. Um, And after that, it was a long, slow catch. Machado was left hanging until 15 kilometres to go when he was finally reeled in. And that set up quite a hectic finale. On the run-in, Simon Clark of Cannondale Drapak and Philippe Gilbert, the Belgian champion, attacked with 2.4 kilometres to go. That looked pretty handy for a while, but they were caught with a kilometre left. Then the TV cameras showed us Stephen Krausweich of Lotto NL Jumbo uh, lying on the floor. He crashed on the side of the road and had a suspected broken collarbone, certainly out of the race anyway. Uh, There was a second crash in the final kilometre, which also caused havoc. Um, The sprint really was a... It was a pretty much a formality for Gianni Mearsman of Etix Quickstep. The Etix Quickstep team had it all sewn up and he won the stage, his second stage of the race, ahead of Fabio Fellini and Kevin Razor. Darwin Atapuma lost time, but the three kilometre rule was applied, meaning that he keeps the red jersey by 29 seconds from Alejandro Valverde. So chaos at the end today. Yeah, it was chaotic and it was a, an exciting uphill finish. I mean, a lot of people highlighting the exposed pole which um, seems to have caused a crash certainly Bram Tanking and George Bennett teammates of Stephen Kreuzwick have said on social media they think that that's what caused the crash it was a very similar um, type of pole that caused a terrible uh, crash Peter Stettin at the Tour of the Basque Country last year um, and yeah these things should be covered up shouldn't they really and especially in the final final couple of kilometres of the stage when Things are frantic, the, the bunch is, is weaving all over the road, and if that is what has caused Kreuzwick's crash, then he has a very justifiable gripe against the organisation. You say covered up, Rich, but I think that a pole like that should be removed, regardless of whether or not it was the one that caused the crash that has put Stephen Krausweik out of the race. Bram Tankink posted a picture, a screen grab from the television on his Twitter feed. If anyone wants to look that up, it's Bram Tankink, B-R-A-M-T-A-N-K-I-N-K, on Twitter, and he, he circled in red where the uh, the post is, and it's a good few feet out from the edge of the pavement. Um, in the road and really when organising a Grand Tour and thinking how close to the finish that is that's the sort of thing that the race organisers and local authorities should be removing not just yeah I mean it's completely ideally. exposed yeah although I, I think the, one of the problems is that it's just not very visible is it it's small and it's a dark object against you know in the shadows and uh, the chances are riders didn't see it and uh, if it's just a bit more visible if it has 
uh, some kind of cushioning around it, then it would be okay. It would be a, a very visible obstacle to avoid. But yeah, that's it's big shame for Croiswick, uh, who obviously was targeting a, a decent ride here at the Vuelta. And he's lost a bit of time, but he looked he looked okay, and he probably would have come good in the mountains. So huge shame that he's out of the race, and his team have said he's off to the hospital for for scans. The second crash we don't know quite so much about, do we? The TV cameras didn't really catch it properly. There ha- has been some footage that shows Chris Froome uh, just avoiding it. Um, he was very lucky not to be not to be caught up in it, but uh, several riders were at least held up, and uh, and it made for a, a, a very reduced uh, group coming into the finish. At first, I thought Froome uh, th- th- thought there'd been a split, and Froome was bridging across uh, the, the 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 great divide, but that wasn't the case. It was a crash that had caused the split. Yeah, and it's been a while, uh, it's taken a long while for the organisers to sort out the results and and, uh, make sure that everybody uh, gets the correct time. But the most important thing at the very top end of the GC is that Darwin Atapuma keeps the red jersey for for another day. Um, But uh, it was another impressive finish by Etix Quickstep, wasn't it? Um, Not that they've got the greatest amount of opposition, even if everybody stays upright. But when you've got uh, Denex Stebar, uh, doing the lead out and Janny Mearsman finishing it off. That's quite a, a formidable um, tandem to try and get around. And Mearsman's having a, a great race. It's um, clearly his biggest uh, set of results of his career so far. A couple of Grand Tour stage wins. Yeah, they, um, they had a great quite, Giro, didn't they? Uh, at its quick set. A, a poor classics campaign, a great Giro, a, a, a poor tour for them. And it looks like they're having a, a decent Vuelta. Indeed, and, and Mearsman um, doesn't really get that many opportunities to um, ride for himself um, and, and, and pick up wins in Grand Tours. I mean, if you he didn't ride a Grand Tour at all last year. Uh, sorry, he did. He started the Giro, but only lasted four days. Um, the year before that, he didn't ride a Grand Tour. So this is a, a sort of rare opportunity for him. And, he's, I mean, he's a good rider. He's been a professional for coming up for 10 years now he turned pro very young I think he was only 20 or 21 when he turned pro for Discovery Channel and he's sort of been around the block a bit he's at Francais de Jure for a while Lotto Bellisol for a while and he's been with Etics or Amiga Pharma as they were originally um, for I think this is his fourth or fifth year um, and cycling clearly in his genes because his grandfather was a pro Maurice Meersman I don't, don't know if you know this, Rich. He rode the Tour de France in 1948. Probably the best result of his career. Second in Het Volk in 1950. Didn't know and that. Didn't dad, know that. No. And his dad was a pro as well. Mm. Raced uh, mostly for sort of small Belgian squads. He did a couple of years at Splendor, which was one of Sean Kelly's old teams, although they didn't overlap. Um, and so, yeah, clearly uh, it's, it's in the genes. And uh, a couple of Vuelta stage wins for him. In, uh, in the opening f- five days uh, whether he'll get another opportunity could be a bit of a gap now before he gets another opportunity though well did I read today that he may be off or is off to Fortuneo Vital Concept next year well that's uh, that's a bit of a bit of a move to the championship isn't it <laughs> well I, I, I may have imagined it I'm pretty sure I read that today there's huge uncertainty of course around Etics quick set I think we talked about this on the podcast last week um, about whether that, that team will even exist beyond next year they're signing up riders only until the end of 2017 and you know, that's been a factor in, in Tony Martin leaving perhaps and in a, in a general air of uncertainty around that team um, which uh, despite that you know they're performing extremely well listen we've got Daniel Freebout in Spain um, shall we hear from him I wonder if tonight's dispatch will be as left field as last night's over to you Daniel Good evening chaps, the day when we're all going to be reunited, or at least two of us are going to be reunited in Spain at the Vuelta, it's inching ever closer, you can hear the excitement in my voice I'm sure. Um, where am I tonight? Good question, Monforte I think it's called, uh, excuse the Italian accent, tends to pronounce everything Spanish with an Italian accent. Anyway, still in Galicia, very much enjoyed our time in Galicia, absolutely loved the landscapes, have absolutely hated the architecture. Um, it quite extraordinary, some of it. Um, the towns are, well, they often look as though they belong in particularly impoverished parts of the Eastern Bloc. Um, I know that sounds quite disrespectful to Galicia and the people here have been fantastic, but the architecture really is a marvel of bad taste. 
anyway, or just or simply functionality over over aesthetics, I suppose, if I'm being kind. Anyway, um, going back to today's race, um, not too eventful until the last 2.2 kilometers really when Stephen Crowswick, who's one of the favorites for this race on GC, crashed, or we think he crashed into a bollard, a pole, um, very, very similar to the one that Peter Stettiner crashed into last year at the Tour of the Basque Country. Peter Stettiner sustained terrible, terrible injuries. Um, his career looks as though it might be over at one point. He's made a, a pretty heroic comeback. He rode the Tour de France recently. Um, but the UCI assured us after that incident in the Tour of the Basque Country that these kind of bollards, these kind of poles, um, would have to be taken out in races in future and that safety was their number one priority. There's been a lot of talk about that in the last few months um, and yet we still get a situation like the one today and um, it's quite extraordinary really. When you consider not only you know the amount of planning that goes into a race like the Vuelta from the organisers point of view um, and you know let's not forget ASO, the Tour de France organisers are uh, well, heavily involved. They they pretty much run the Vuelta these days in association with Unipublic, um, the former sole owners of the Vuelta, sole proprietors of the Vuelta. Um, but, you know, the UCI as well. But then also even the teams themselves. Um, it's very much de rigueur these days to wreck a race routes. And certainly the last two, three kilometres of race routes on the day of the race, the teams generally send someone up the road to scout for them and to take pictures and to send them back. And, um, you know, journalists as well. We, a lot of us, drove the course today. And to think that no one noticed this this pole, which was not quite in the middle of the road, but very much um, on the, the course, the trajectory that the riders were going to take, um, is quite amazing, really. And um, I think if anyone should feel aggrieved tonight and, and quite bitter and quite angry, it's not just Stephen Kreiswick, but Peter Stettiner, because, you know, that accident I mentioned last year in the Tour of the Basque Country, that should have been a cautionary tale, really, for the whole of professional cycling, and action should have been taken quickly. And I know that action is being taken by organisations like the CPA, the Riders' Organisation, people like the former uh, racer Christian van der Velde, very uh, in instrumental, very, um, very active in that. And I know they're doing a lot of hard work to try and improve things on the safety front. But, it's, you know, it's, it really does require urgent action when accidents like today's occur. Anyway, that's about all from me. Um, pretty sour dispatch tonight. Um, I'm sorry, there's nothing more positive to talk about. Anyway, I'm sure there will be over the coming days when Richard, I've now ascertained that it's Richard, not Lionel, who's going to be joining me when he finally arrives in Spain. So that's all from me. Have a good evening, chaps, and catch up with you tomorrow. Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you very much to Eurosport for continuing to sponsor the Cycling Podcast. I'll be going out to Spain tomorrow armed with a few Peddler de Charme t-shirts in Vuelta colours, Lionel. We've got some uh, some reds wow. and yellows in there. So that, that new range will be on the website, thecyclingpodcast.com. And I'll, I'll take a, a, a bundle of them uh, and present them to riders who are deemed worthy of Peddler de Charme. So keep your peepers peeled, people for riders whose efforts deserve a nomination for Peddler de Charme. We're going to run a poll, aren't we, some days to decide on who should win Peddler de Charme? I think we are, yeah. Um, we should get that underway. I think when you get out there so that you can arbitrate, you'll be keeping a very close eye on the char charming peddling that's going on. I will, I will. Um, another uh, thank you also to Rafa, of course, for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. And tomorrow morning, that's Thursday morning, first thing, I believe, we will be releasing another little bonus episode, uh, which is a conversation with Sir Bradley Wiggins. That was in, held in the Rafa Cycle Club last Last Thursday, just after he'd returned from Rio with his fifth Olympic gold medal, uh, eighth Olympic medal in total. And it was a 25-minute chat in front of a, an audience. And, uh, you know, he's in, in good form. He was very relaxed and speaking a little bit about Rio and the team pursuit and also looking ahead to the future and what, what the future holds for him and his team, Team Wiggins, which I think is going to be a big part of his, big part of his future. So, yeah, that's all... That's all. Um, that's all coming up tomorrow morning. A little bonus, and uh, just on today's stage, Lionel. I mean, you mentioned in your tale of the etapa, uh, Gilbert and uh, Simon Clark. I mean, Simon Clark launched a real do or die effort. Uh, now, Canada have a, a strong team at the Vuelta. They're clearly, you know, up for doing something. Um, Pierre Roland 
tried to get across to the winning move the day before. Had he done so, he might have won a stage. There, Simon Clark had a go. They're, they really need, it's not so much that they want to do something, they need to do something at the Vuelta, don't they? Uh, they do, yeah. I mean, when you think back to the Giro, they really were hoping to do something big there with uh, Rigoberto Uran uh, going for the overall, and that didn't come off. Um, I, I mean, if you look at the list of teams that have... Uh, you know, won World Tour races this season. I mean, it's been a shocker for Cannondale. Um, I think they've only had one World Tour win. Is that right? Or have they had a World Tour podium? But they, they've really not had the best year at all. And I th- we remember uh, bumping into Jonathan Vorters on the Champs Elysees uh, at the end of the Tour de France, a really torrid Tour de France for the whole team. Pierre along their big hope. Everything was pinned on him, and and uh, he he crashed out. Uh, not crashed out but he crashed out of contention um, crashed a couple of and, times didn't uh, he hit, hit a wall yeah. on the first day in the Pyrenees and then or starting on the stage into Luchon hit a wall with his hand uh, didn't go and get the hand x-rayed because he didn't want to find out that it was broken and then he had another terrible crash didn't he when he got himself into a into a stage winning opportunity yeah and they've had a I mean I said they, they, they've had a uh, have they had a World Tour win? They haven't had a, a, a World Tour race win. Their best result in the World Tour is Alberto Betiol's third place in the Tour of Poland, which pretty much went unnoticed because um, the Tour of Poland was going on while the Tour de France was on. So it's been a torrid year, and, and they need something to boost morale, I suspect, at the Vuelta. And they've got riders in that lineup that could do so. Oh, yeah. Look, looking at. That's the A team, isn't it? Talansky is there, Tal- Dombrowski, Simon Clark, Pierre Roland is there. Um, and so you looked at um, the win for Kalmajan of Direct Energy yesterday and, and you know that was a, a fantastic victory for them. They're not in the World Tour, um, but they get to ride uh, quite a lot of the World Tour races. You know, that, that sort of opportunity wouldn't come along at the Tour de France. And so, you know, it's probably quite a smart move by Cannondale to pick such a strong team for the Vuelta. And, and hopefully if they can um, just avoid bad luck, they'll come good yeah. um, later on in the race the pressure is on though and you know that was a really good effort by Simon Clark today and when Philip Gilbert got across to him you thought well that might stay clear you would have fancied Gilbert perhaps in the in the sprint but um, still a, a, a really good effort by him do you remember when we bumped into Jonathan Walters in Paris he said that that there, there was one signing that he was really excited about he, he was somebody who he felt would would be a leader, not so much perhaps on the bike but off the bike. Um, a big personality. I think I think that's Taylor Finney. Oh, interesting. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Uh, they've signed Seth Van Mark, of course. That's being confirmed from Lotto NL Jumbo. He'll be a, uh, you know a big hope for them for the classics, Flanders and and Roubaix, and uh, expect great things from him. Uh, but Taylor Finney would be a very strong backup for Seth Van Mark and somebody who can and, and should win races in his own right. Yeah, assuming he can get back to that level after the, the terrible crash, it's been a, a long, a long, quite slow return to the top for him, hasn't it? Yeah, sorry about that noise in the background. There's a, a young child just crushing a plastic thing in front of me, taking great delight as I screw up my face at him. Anyway, it's probably a sign <laughs> that we should finish things off there, Lionel. Um, and I'm, as I said, I'm heading out to Spain tomorrow, so I will be speaking to you tomorrow from Spain. Or will I be speaking to you? I think I will be speaking to you and then picking up with Daniel from Friday onwards. I think so, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll see you through tomorrow and then I'm taking a kind of a, a, a back seat for a week. Probably do the tale of the attack. Well, I hope so. Then, uh, Who else is going to do it? Yeah. And, well, uh, Rob Hatch. Get Rob, get Rob oh, Hatch yeah. to do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> just, just the very last one um, just on riders and their names from the uh, from the top five today Zico uh, Zico Waitens mm. the Belgian rider with Giant Alperson am I, am I imagining this or has Daniel told us before that he is named after the great Brazilian footballer Zico I think he is and I was wondering if Gianni Meersman is, is named it's an Italian name isn't it I wonder uh, well, but he's Belgian I, is he named <laughs> after Gianni Motta or something well, I was—I did wonder that. I was doing a bit of research, and I found on a Belgian site that uh, wondering whether he, because his dad was a pro racer, whether whether his dad had named him after an old teammate or a, or a great Italian rider that he admired. But no, apparently he's named after a, an Italian restaurant called Gianni <laughs> that his dad and that his dad that his dad and mum used to visit. Brilliant. Well, it could, um, well, it could be young, Pizza younger, Express. 
<laughs> his younger brother's called Luigi, who's also an amateur rider or was an amateur rider in Belgium, didn't make it as a pro. But I wonder whether the waiter was called Luigi. Uh, I'm not sure. Speculation that. That is, that is speculation. I'll tell you what, I'll try and find out when I'm out there. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's, let's leave it for there, Lionel. Thank you very much again, and uh, I'll speak to you tomorrow. Thanks very much. Yeah, have a safe trip to Spain and um, enjoy the sangria when you land. Thank you.